Okay, welcome everybody to today's webinar focused on energy economic impact in Wisconsin. We're going to have a great background on the impacts of focus on energy incentives made available to customers in the state and have a Q&A with a panel of Wisconsin businesses. Today's webinar is brought to you by Renew Wisconsin and several organizations we've collaborated to bring this webinar to you today. Little background on Renew Wisconsin. Uh, Renew Wisconsin is a nonprofit organization dedicated to building a stronger, healthier, more vibrant Wisconsin through the advancement of renewable energy. Uh, we support the following renewable energy resources, as well as electric vehicles, energy storage, and beneficial electrification, such as the electrification of buildings as we move towards a clean energy future. Uh, also, Reno, Wisconsin is celebrating its 30th year anniversary this year. We're going to be having a celebratory event on August 3rd. So ho hopefully, uh, if you're interested in that, you'll be able to join us on August 3rd. Little overview of the webinar today. We're going to have some introductory remarks from uh, Dan York of ACEEE, Scott Blankman of Clean Wisconsin, and Manny Wazowitz of the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. We're also going to have a panelist led by Dan York as moderator to discuss the impact of focus on energy for Wisconsin's businesses. Uh, this includes Sean Hyland of American Family Insurance, Charles McGinnis of Johnson Controls, and Benjamin Reynolds of Reynolds Transfer and Storage, and Tim Ulrich of Cree Lighting. First, we're going to have some introductory remarks, like I said, and Maddie will also have some uh, slides for us to talk about focus on energy background. Uh, first of all, Dan York is a senior fellow at ACEEE, engaged primarily in utilities and local policy research and technical assistance. He focuses on tracking and analyzing trends and emerging issues in utility sector energy efficiency programs. Dan has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Minnesota, his master of science and PhD degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Madison are both in land resources with an emphasis on energy analysis and policy. So Dan, you wanna kick it off with some opening remarks for us? Sure, thank you, Andrew. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. I'm delighted to be part of this discussion today about the benefits of energy efficiency for Wisconsin's businesses, industry, and overall economy. In turn, we'll hear about the very real value provided by Wisconsin's Focus on Energy program to advance energy efficiency and clean renewable energy in our state. Wisconsin was an early leader in advancing energy efficiency through programs serving utility customers going back, way back to the 1980s when I was studying energy policy at UW-Madison. Focus on energy was a new approach to such programs created in 2001. Over time, Focus on Energy has grown, matured, and become a nationally renowned program. An analysis conducted a few years ago by Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory found that Focus on Energy was the most cost-effective program serving utility customers in the U.S. That is, it achieved the lowest cost for every saved kilowatt hour. Independent evaluation of Focus on Energy shows that every Focus on Energy program dollar yields over $4.80 in economic benefits to the state, including reduced energy costs and reduced pollution. Participants in the program report high satisfaction, a score of 9.3 out of 10. For the period 2015 to 2018, 2015 to 2018, Focus on Energy created almost 21,000 jobs and is projected to generate an additional 5,250 jobs for each program year. We Wisconsinites can, take, can well take pride in these accomplishments. However, when viewed through a different lens, Wisconsin's leadership has faded. My organization conducts annual reviews of state level energy efficiency policies and programs resulting in our state scorecard report. In 2008, Wisconsin ranked ninth in the nation. Top 10 status is very good. In 2020, it was 26th. So what is the disconnection between the very positive evaluation results of focus on energy and ACEEE's state scorecard? 
The principal difference is that while other states have increased their investments in associated spending for utility customer energy efficiency programs, such funding in Wisconsin has been largely static, locked in by the legislation that created Focus on Energy. In short, Focus does very well within its budget, but to really excel, it would need to grow and do more of what it's been doing for the past 20 years. While these big picture issues of funding, job creation, and economic benefits are important, such discussions can be very abstract. So today we are drilling down to talk with businesses and industries that have benefited from participating in Focus on Energy, as well as those that benefit more broadly by providing products and services that advance energy efficiency. Our goal is to put a very real face on energy efficiency and show that reducing energy use through improved efficiency is good for all types of businesses in Wisconsin. Thank you, and back to you, Andrew. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'll introduce Scott Blakeman. Scott is Director of Energy and Air Program at Clean Wisconsin. Scott is responsible for policies on utilities, energy, and air issues, which advance the mission of Clean Wisconsin. He serves as the technical lead for the analysis of utility and energy policies to inform advocacy and action in support of Clean Wisconsin's climate change efforts. Prior to joining Clean Wisconsin, Mr. Blakeman was a director for 13 years at Alliant Energy, where his work included concentration on utility operations and strategic planning efforts. So go ahead, Scott, if you wanna make a few introductory remarks. Thank you, Andrew. As Dan previously mentioned, FOCUS was created in 2001 and is funded by the state's utilities and their customers. Uh, funding has essentially been capped at that 1.2%. Um, and when we look at the opportunities that are available to the Focus on Energy program, the most recent draft potential study indicates that there are significant opportunities if funding constraints were lifted. Um, residential and industrial and solar PV segments are some of the key areas that provide tremendous opportunities for the Focus on Energy program to continue to expand. And as Dan mentioned, the program has seen significant technological changes over the years. And as we look at the future, we see those technological changes continuing and pro providing a lot more opportunity for the program to kind of reinvent itself and, and modify its offerings on a go forward basis to react to our more connected way of life. Maddie's going to talk a little bit more about some of those opportunities in the next conversation. And I'm gonna turn it over to her um, to be able to highlight some of the opportunities that exist with the existing program offerings um, and what the potential might look like. So Andrew. Hey, Scott. So yeah, and I'll introduce Maddie Wazowitz. Maddie is Senior Policy Associate at Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, also known as MIA. Maddie is uh, on MIA's, MIA's policy team. She was responsible for tracking legislative and regulatory developments, coordinating outreach, producing advocacy materials, and leading MIA's policy work in Minnesota, Michigan, Nebraska, and Wisconsin. Maddie also works on educating new lawmakers and regulators on Midwest energy policy. Additionally, Maddie works on energy efficiency financing, clean energy workforce, rural and tribal energy issues, and energy efficiency and affordable housing. So Maddie, if you wanna give some introductory remarks, I'll also get your uh, slides getting started here. Great, thanks. Hello everyone, I'm Maddie. Um, I'm gonna walk through a little bit on how FOCUS works and some recent research uh, Mia and Synapse have conducted on the potential of FOCUS. Next slide. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, MIA is a nonprofit membership-based organization. Our members include state and local governments, nonprofit and advocacy organizations, utilities, implementers, and evaluators. Our goal at MIA is to advocate for energy efficiency in our 13 state territory by championing the environmental, economic, and utility system benefits of energy efficiency. Next slide. As many of you know, and, and as we've talked about a little already, uh, Wisconsin uses a statewide administrator to operate energy efficiency programs in the state. Uh, this is different from the other Midwestern states with energy efficiency resource standards, where utilities are in charge of operating their entire energy efficiency portfolios in-house and are mandated to reach a certain level of energy savings through their programs. 
Instead, Wisconsin's administrator focus on energy is, is funded by the state's utilities, which contribute 1.2% of revenues to focus. Focus then takes that money to run energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. Next slide. Uh, this contribution percentage, as mentioned, um, was, de was determined by the state and has resulted in funding levels for FOCUS remaining relatively flat for the last several years. FOCUS's budget has been a topic of conversation for some time. Uh, various attempts have been made, with some succeeding, to strip FOCUS of funding or direct those funds elsewhere. But the benefits of FOCUS are clear. FOCUS most recent evaluation report shows that every dollar spent by FOCUS returns $3 or $4.32 in benefits to Wisconsin. FOCUS continues to be amongst the, the best in the country in portfolio cost effectiveness. With this in mind, uh, advocates have continued to push for more FOCUS funding. Governor Evers has included this in budget proposals and increasing funding levels appeared as a recommendation in last year's Governor's Task Force on Climate Change report and will likely be included in the state's upcoming clean energy plan. Next slide. Um, so this is kind of showing what, what Dan mentioned a little bit. Um, to demonstrate where the state is in, in energy efficiency funding, here's a heat map of the 13 states MIA covers showing investment in electric energy efficiency programs. You can see that Wisconsin is clearly behind all of its neighboring states and significantly behind Illinois, which is expected to spend about 450 million on electric EE programs in Michigan, which is expected to spend about 342 million. Next slide. Uh, and here's a heat map on the gas efficiency side. Uh, Wisconsin is considerably behind Minnesota, Michigan, and Illinois. Uh, Michigan actually is on track to spend nearly seven times more than Wisconsin on gas efficiency programs with a planned spend of 122 million. So uh, with political conversations continuing around focus on energy budget levels, uh, Mia set out to, to quantify what an increase to focus's budget could mean for the state. Uh, we kind of, we were just looking to see what benefits Wisconsin was missing out on by not increasing focus's budget. For this research, uh, we asked Synapse to run some modeling to see what would happen if Wisconsin doubled its focus uh, on energy budget from approximately 100 million to 200 million. So the following slides show the benefits from that additional 100 million, not the total benefits of, of the theoretical $200 million budget. Next slide. So this first slide shows the money that customers would save on their bills. An extra 100 million to focus would lead to nearly 17 million in bill savings for commercial customers and nearly 4 million in bill savings for residential customers. This slide demonstrates what focus has been saying for years through its evaluation reports. The focus on energy program is extremely cost effective and every dollar put into the program leads to more bill savings for customers. This next slide demonstrates the amount of energy savings that would be realized if FOCUS's budget were to double. Over 1.5% of statewide electricity sales would be saved, with 0.58% of energy sales saved in the residential sector, and 0.94% of energy sales saved in the commercial sector. This is a tremendous amount of energy saved, and when combined with existing savings from the FOCUS on Energy portfolio, would put Wisconsin more in line with the savings achieved from states in the region like Minnesota. This chart shows the total avoided cost that the Wisconsin utility system would save at 358 million, which is a sizable return on investment for the state. Uh, the next slide breaks down where those savings would be achieved. So out of that 358 million, a big percentage of the avoided cost would come from avoided energy costs, which are estimated at 225 million. Followed by those savings are savings from avoided capacity and avoided transmission and distribution costs, which collectively would save over 117 million. And lastly, the utility system would save about 15 million from wholesale price effects. In total, doubling Focus's budget would lead to a tremendous amount of savings in the utility system, which ultimately benefits consumers as well. 
In addition to the financial savings, reducing energy consumption and therefore generation would have benefits to Wisconsin's air quality. This chart shows the avoided emissions of nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide, fine particulate matter, and carbon dioxide in million tons. Reducing the presence of these particles in the air would benefit all Wisconsinites. Of course, uh, these particles have negative effects to our environment, but they also contribute to negative health outcomes, which we'll get to in the next slide. So this demonstrates some of the health costs that would be avoided through increasing FOCUS's budget. Energy efficiency uh, leading to health benefits is probably a little bit less obvious than the benefits uh, to customer bills or the utility system. But as the last slide demonstrated, lessening consumption and generation directly leads to less harmful pollutants in our air. Pollutants from burning fossil fuels contribute to four of the leading causes of death in the nation, cancer, chronic lower respiratory disease, heart disease, and stroke. Fine particulate matter and nitrogen oxide from burning fossil fuels are proven to contribute to a variety of serious respiratory issues, such as lung cancer, COPD, and asthma. Increasing FOCUS's budget and energy efficiency programming in Wisconsin would lead to seven, up to 7.7 .7 million in avoided healthcare costs, which come from uh, avoided hospital visits and emergency room stays. So uh, those are our initial findings, but much, much more will be included in the final MIA synapse report, which is scheduled to be released in the coming weeks uh, and will be on our website at mwalliance.org. Uh, the report makes it clear that more funding for focus will lead to more bill savings for customers, more savings from avoided generation for utilities, and better air quality for all of Wisconsin. Additionally, if you're interested in other states, the report will explore additional policies and their effects in the Midwest, like the impacts of Ohio and Iowa's regressive energy efficiency policies and the effects of Illinois' large consumer exemption. For any questions on the report or anything I covered on Wisconsin, um, I'll stay around for a Q&A and you can always email me there. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. And I uh, just wanted to let the attendees know that uh, we're going to be having Q&A at the very end of the uh, webinar today, and you can feel free to put those in the chat discussion, uh, either starting that now or waiting until um, the end of the panel discussion. Uh, that being said, we are going to move into uh, initial remarks by our panelists today. Um, we're going to have, like I said, bios and remarks from our four business representative panelists and then Dan York will take it away as a moderator to engage in uh, question and answer to talk about their experience with focus and energy. First we've got Sean Highland at American Family Insurance. Sean is the facilities program administrator for American Family Insurance focusing on renewables, energy management, data center management, and implementation of data science into facilities operations. Do you want to go ahead, Sean, and have a few introductory remarks? Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I've been with American Family Insurance a little bit more than eight years, and through that whole time period, Focus on Energy has been a, a strong partner for us. Uh, as we go through and evaluate our existing facilities and uh, go through a continuous process of making improvements, um, not only in that, that area, but uh, early on in uh, the development of the Spark Building here in Madison, um, Focus on Energy has been an integral partner for us in the design assistance program. Uh, this facility is one of the state-of-the-art uh, energy efficiency, sustainable, uh, uh, great places to work buildings here in Madison. Uh, it's been nationally recognized through several awards and recently has received lead silver. Uh, focus on energy has also been a uh, a uh, strong partner for us in the, uh, doing retro commissioning of our facilities. Uh, leveraging those programs, we've made uh, improvements to several of our facilities. Um, we've also taken uh, great advantage of their prescriptive incentives pro program. Uh, 
taken advantage of the uh, lighting incentives, uh, BFD drives, uh, similar uh, prescriptive incentives. We've also taken advantage of the custom incentives uh, programs, those things that are a little bit uh, not straightforward, but definitely has an impact on being able to drive energy efficiency. Um, currently working with focusing, uh, focus on energy on standing up and implementing a uh, fault detection and diagnostic program at national headquarters, which uh, what that is, is it's a, a program that resides on top of our building automation system, looking at the individual systems that we have, seeing how they're performing and creating insights for us early on in the equipment's operation to uh, make adjustments to maintain a high level of efficiency. Um, I like to think of it as a continuous commissioning program as opposed to a retro commissioning program. And uh, yeah, it's uh, that partnership has worked out very well. Um, obviously, Focus on Energy has been a, an important partner for American family. Uh, leveraging these incentives, along with our triple bottom line calculator that we use, which is taking uh, the impact of uh, projects uh, and weighing it against people, planet, and profit. Uh, quite often, uh, the focus, incentive, uh, focus on energy incentive has helped to advance projects that normally would not have been able to uh, get advanced. Um, and so helping to drive the uh, return on investment has been a, a critical tool for American family and uh, Looking forward to doing several uh, additional projects in the future. So I'll turn it back over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Sean. Uh, next, we're going to have an introductory remark by Charles K. McGinnis of Johnson Controls. Uh, Charles is currently Vice President of Performance Infrastructure and Energy Solutions for Johnson Controls North America and former Chairman of the Board for the National Association of Energy Services Companies. Mr. McGinnis has managed or supervised businesses implementing over $6 billion in infrastructure or energy projects, which has delivered in excess of $900 million in verifiable energy savings over his 31-year tenure. Charles is also Emeritus Vice Chair on the Clean Wisconsin Board of Directors. Do you want to go ahead, Charles, with some remarks? Thank you, Andrew. And I'd like to thank Renew Wisconsin, ACEEE, uh, Clean Wisconsin and Mia for putting this great program together as well as uh, welcome my fellow panelists. I'd, I'd like to, I guess, frame my comments to talk a little bit about background of why this is important to Johnson Controls, um, talk about some of the perspectives and, and, and the importance to our business, highlight a recent project, and um, really uh, describe our journey to net zero. And what I mean by that is a journey with our customers to net zero. So first off, I do want to let everyone know that Johnson Controls was founded in Wisconsin in 1885. And we were a spinoff of, of what was called the Normal School in Whitewater, Wisconsin, which today is UW-Whitewater. So we're like one of these technology spinoffs from 1885. And Professor Warren Johnson wanted to change the temperature of his classroom. And so he invented the, the damper actuator. And it was really the first attempt towards a healthy building and, and to, to a large degree energy conservation because they were moving the windows up and down. Today, uh, the Performance Infrastructure Group is exclusively dedicated to helping our customers down the journey of net zero. <clears throat> now, I'll tell you that Johnson Controls takes advantage of focus on energy uh, incentives in three different ways. Number one, we manufacture products that are sold through distribution that many contractors buy or owners buy and implement, and they use prescriptive incentives for that. Second is we have hundreds of trucks and you've seen them. They have York on them, they have Simplex Grinnell, they have Tyco, they have Johnson Controls on the side. <clears throat> And these are service technicians and steam fitters that are working in buildings. And many times they're forcing a decision with the owner that's repair or replace, right? And typically it's cheaper to repair 
right? But may, many times it's a better decision to replace, but maybe they need to have some justification for that. A nice prescriptive incentive is a great way to do that. And then third is really what performance infrastructure does, which is help our customers down the path of net zero. Uh, these are traditionally large scale projects. They're typically financed. We guarantee that the energy savings are realized. And most recently, we were able to leverage um, over $300,000 in incentives, about 250,000 of which came from Focus on Energy to help the city of La Crosse uh, launch a new phase of sustainability uh, that that's gonna generate $11 million in cost savings. It's both renewable energy and energy efficiency. We like to say reduce in order to pr produce, not necessarily se uh, sequentially, you can do them at the same time because you can just model the building and determine what your loads are and apply the renewable energy and do it all as one project. And that's fundamentally what the City of La Crosse did in three different phases. Uh, we're really excited about that. And the, the City of La Crosse would not have done the projects without those incentives. And they were very important. We built an entire business around uh, energy efficiency. And for example, the, that City of La Crosse project um, is going to produce a hundred local contracting jobs, not not including what we, what, you know, our Johnson Controls people, where we have five or six folks involved there. So we really believe that Wisconsin focus, the focus on energy is really important to the Wisconsin economy, and that um, you know it's it's really really critical. Last, I just want to make one more point about journey to net zero. This journey to net zero that we're all on is really important. And having a roadmap that's, that we can implement either as a large project or in phases is critical. And so, um, you know, focus on energy is really important to the economy, really important to Johnson Controls. We love serving our customers and helping them towards their goal of net zero. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Next, I will introduce Benjamin Reynolds of Reynolds Transfer and Storage. Benjamin Reynolds is Director of Operations at Reynolds Transfer and Storage, a Madison-based moving and storage company specializing in local and nationwide residential, commercial, and industrial moves. Ben learned to apply sustainability as a business strategy while earning a master's at UW-Madison and has helped Reynolds install three solar arrays and complete a variety of other energy efficiency projects. So you wanna go ahead, Benjamin, with some introductory remarks. Of course, and uh, I'll echo what, what uh, Chuck said. Thanks for having me. I'm you know, really excited to be here. Uh, so I, I was kind of struck as I was listening to uh, both Sean and uh, Charles talk just now on, you know, not only do we have the focus on energy link for the projects that we've done as a company, but we also have the link for the, the money that's come back to us from our customers um, with Johnson Controls being a customer of ours. And you know us actually being hired by Johnson Controls and other companies that they work work with and work for to actually do the implementation of some of the machines that get swapped out. So just to back up for a moment, um, as Andrew mentioned uh, just now, we've done three solar arrays on our various buildings. All of those we've received some sort of grant funding from Focus on Energy. I think at this point we're up over like $30,000 in grants to help pay for those solar arrays, which has been hugely beneficial for us to try to, you know, reduce the upfront cost of the investment and then also just, you know, help us recoup the, the payback period much quicker. Um, from our standpoint, uh, it, it really helps drive the decision between should we invest in a solar array that helps us reduce our overhead costs or should we buy another say semi truck or, or trailer or another big forklift or um, like we just did recently, purchased another building. Uh, so we get to, to go through this building now and with the help of Focus on Energy, swap out all the light bulbs for LEDs prior to actually filling the building up with, with our customers' belongings. Um, so we kind of have the, the, the Focus on Energy story of how it's helped us succeed as a company but then we also have the focus on energy story of being part of the projects that our customers hire us to do, whether it's Johnson Controls or we have a handful of solar customers that hire us to actually help them 
install the, the solar arrays that go on to um, their customers' buildings. So we had a hand in the American Family install that was shown at the start. Um, a, a good chunk of those solar panels were stored at our building at, at various points. Um, a lot of the equipment came through our building at, at some point during that project. Uh, we had some involvement in the solar array that was put in out by the Dane County Airport, which was really fun to be a part of. Um, and then, you know, just as recently as last week, we were doing a delivery for a solar install that was near nearby in Madison here, which I'm sure received some sort of focus on energy dollars. So um, they mentioned a couple times each focus on energy dollar contributes four dollars and some cents to the local economy. We're definitely one of the people that sees the result of that on the back end as well. So, you know, for us, it's just it's fun to be able to see the, the entire, you know, kind of circuit from start to finish and, you know, be involved not only on the grant application and receiving the grant side, but then also on, you know, being part of the actual uh, implementation of the projects themselves. So I think I hit everything I was going to talk about. Okay, hey, thank you, Benjamin. And now I'm going to introduce Tim Ulrich of Cree Lighting. Tim is EHS Director and Facilities Manager at Cree Lighting. Tim focuses his time on implementing systems that achieve intended outcomes, environmental management systems, energy management systems, safety management systems, facility management systems, and zero waste to landfill systems. Tim has experience working in commercial LED lighting since its inception. It works to ensure that Cree Lighting sustainable products are manufactured in a sustainable facility. Tim, you want to go ahead with some remarks? Yes, thank you. Uh, that covers uh, you know, a large majority of my role, trying to make sure that how we manufacture our LED lighting lives up to you know, the uh, customer's expectation and the environmental impacts that uh, come along with that. Um, so in addition to the uh, aforementioned programs, uh, we are also worked with We Energies and were able to get a, a solar array installed on uh, two portions of our building through the Solar Now program. Excellent uh, program if it's available to you in your area, so check with your local utility. Um, basically zero out of pocket and the, um, the, uh, the lease arrangement benefits all. It takes pressure off the grid allowing further uh, transition to renewables. So, um, but for the LED lighting world, it is uh, obviously not uh, uh, exciting or brand new anymore, but the lumens per watt continues to improve year over year over year. Uh, ourselves and our competitors do very well in uh, advancing the um, <clears throat> reduction of consumption of electrons, thereby facilitating other things like uh, solar or avoiding uh, expansions of uh, utilities. Um, but for our, you know, so we you know, make and, and sell the lights, which are of course available for the prescriptive incentives. But for me personally, I have uh, worked with uh, Focus um, over the last three years uh, through the Strategic Energy Management Program to really dive into how to have a uh, functioning and continually improving energy management system. Uh, having an environmental management system I had that pretty well down and the energy uh, is uh, as complicated or more. Uh, so the uh, strategic energy management uh, system sounds uh, a lot like what uh, uh, Chuck's company does with JCI getting to net zero. It is implementing a path to reduce your consumption. Um, and you save twice. I mean, you are eligible for all the prescriptive incentives. Your custom incentive is based off of uh, the electrons you saved and not paid for once. So there's really no downside. Uh, and the uh, amount of pain and suffering cost avoidance I have uh, achieved by not trying to figure it out on my own is probably worth more than all of the incentives combined. Uh, so the expertise that comes with it is, is very, very nice. Um, uh, some examples of how we've really uh, utilized that uh, strategic energy management focus on energy involvement is the expertise. Uh, 2020 was a challenging year for us and many other companies. Um, and our model was based on units produced and shipped. So there's some challenges there, but we were chasing our tails a little bit with some compressed air problems. We realized that we had uh, made some poor decisions in, in earlier equipment selection and using the model, we're able to backtrack to when the 
problem started and kind of zero in on what the equipment that was causing that problem was. Um, general guidance on what is going to get us the most return for the time and money invested, whether it's uh, electric, compressed air, et cetera. Uh, and then some of the things that have been successful in other organizations from a process change, not so much an equipment change uh, towards the customer center uh, side of it. So a lot of expertise, very helpful, helped me avoid a lot of uh, uh, mistakes and, and a whole lot of time spent researching things that others already know a lot about. Um, and a really uh, kind of the bottom line for all of us, I think, is the less we can consume from an electricity and gas standpoint. Uh, electricity in particular, taking that pressure off the grid can allow the transition to renewables to be uh, less expensive and less problems for all utilities and keep all of our costs under control. All right, thanks, Tim. Uh, I'm going to now um, stop sharing my slides to enable a free flowing Q&A discussion with our monitor, uh, Dan York. So. And if you want to go ahead and lead the moderation of the panel and further discuss uh, focus on energy uh, experience in, in Wisconsin with our business members here. Very good. Thanks. Oh, that, that was great um, presentation or comments by all of our, our panelists. That was really fascinating to hear. And I, I love Chuck's um, history of Johnson controls. That's a little factoid I'd never realized. So it's always interesting to see where these um, major industries have sprung from. So um, first of all, to our audience participants, um, if you do have questions for any of our panelists um, or um, in general, drop those in. I guess the Q&A is working there. You can put your questions there. And we'll try to get to some of those as we proceed. Um, to, to open things up, I'm just wondering if um, our panelists might comment on what you see as a role of partnerships and collaborations among key leaders and stakeholders for advancing energy efficiency in industry and for um, businesses across the state and um, talking about uh, not just focus on energy, but the utilities, regulators, state government, local governments, universities, technical colleges, nonprofits, private market. How, how, what advantages or are there advantages for, for partnerships and collaboration? Um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll do kind of round robin here. I'm looking at my screen. I'll start maybe, Sean, any comments on, on what you see that role? Sure, thank you, Dan. Um, well, I'm gonna start off by taking the easy way out and say yes, obviously, <laughs> it's, it's very important. Um, I, I think uh, academia is a great place to start off with uh, early identification of opportunities and then uh, partnering with uh, uh, organizations such as Focus on Energy, uh, government, uh, professional uh, uh, or corporate uh, partners such as Johnson Controls to be able to actually bring a lot of those uh, opportunities to fruition and help educate uh, customers such as uh, American Family or whoever else about the benefits of those opportunities. And uh, early on, a lot of these opportunities are can be challenging to implement because of the uh, how early in uh, in uh, being able to uh, in in the products uh, or technologies maturity. Um, and uh, the cost uh, to bring those technologies to market and that having, some, uh, having those incentives uh, are critical early on to get those opportunities going and continue to uh, spread the word after uh, successful implementation in uh, critical key areas. Very good, thanks. And Chuck, I'm gonna throw this to you next and maybe you can also comment on uh, the, the group that I know uh, Johnson Controls works with of other um, energy related industries, manufacturers in the state that M works, so. Sure, um, that's a great example. Let me first say that, you know, at the state level, they need to lead by example. I mean, they need to say, we are going to establish, you know, high expectations around you know the the roadmap to net zero for our facilities so that local governments k-12 the related public sector entities will follow 
as it relates to private sector, great firms like Sean and 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 Tim and um, and every, you know the the you the Wisconsin-based businesses setting the example for what we should be doing in private sector is really important. Um, you know, M work is is a partnership that has been very uh, effective at demonstrating use of technologies uh, in manufacturing. And so manufacturing sector has historically been a very difficult sector because of their competition for capital. They want a very quick payback. We're talking two, three years sometimes. And a lot of that low hanging fruit uh, is no longer there. Cree's done a great job of selling lots of high, highly efficient uh, lights into the marketplace. And so, you know, some of the, what used to be, you know, low hanging fruit is no longer there. So it takes a, uh, an incentive to get many industrial and manufacturing companies to move to the next level. Uh, and M work has been a great partner in developing this uh, for us. And let me just make one final point, And that is universities um, are doing a great job with data. And I heard Sean talk about this as it relates to um, some of the things they're doing with fault detection. And I heard Tim talk about some, some of the things they're doing with their enterprise uh, energy management system. Um, and you know the data that you can use to drive decisions is really important to be able to collect, and be able to query in order to um, drive to, towards, those, um, towards that, that roadmap to net zero. Tim, comments on uh, partnerships, collaborations, how, how you see that? Uh, the opportunities are kind of endless for this benchmarking and sharing best practice. And again, I think I'm getting the easy end of that equation through the participation in the strategic energy management because I have the uh, people that know what they're doing who work with all the other businesses providing the information and making it a much shorter path to victory. Very good, and and Ben. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think I have a, a nice low hanging fruit example to share of the Wisconsin Sustainable Business Council, which is a nonprofit around the state, which created the Green Masters Program, uh, which is a benchmarking tool that can help companies, you know, figure out ways to implement green programs and sustainability, and that came out of the UW. And so it's a kind of a nice trifecta of, of uh, you know, metrics-based um, benchmarking that is run by a nonprofit, but originally came out of academia and is aimed at helping, you know, small and medium-sized businesses, uh, you know, implement sustainability and, and figure out ways to improve both energy efficiency, but also waste and, and other performance metrics within the organization. Um, so I think, especially from the educational standpoint, something that's really helped, you know, small business like us, we're only 50 to 70 employees, um, you know, really, really helped us get the resources we need to figure out where to start and figure out how to implement these things. Very good. Okay, I'm just going to follow up a little bit on some things that both Sean and Chuck hinted at as far as um, advancing technology. I'm just wondering if you could each comment on um, comparing today's energy efficiency opportunities and technologies to those of maybe 20 years ago. Um, I think, you know, 20, 25 years ago, we were thinking just stuff insulation and walls and um, you know, we'll get some better um, pretty crude compared to modern LED light bulbs and things like that. But um, wh where do you see energy efficiency going? Um, where is it now and where is it heading? And, um, you know, a couple of you can pr comment on that from the perspective of somebody who makes products and then a couple of you can comment on how you use and apply those products. So let's go backwards this time and I'll start with Ben. Any, what kind of technologies are you seeing? It looks like, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think, you know, it, one of the things that I just mentioned during our practice was uh, looking at ways to just off off our load from peak demand um, to other times of day. Uh, it's a little bit similar to what you were asking, but um, just trying to put a timer in for our electric forklift so that we're charging during off peak demand hours in, instead of uh, paying peak demand charges to, you know, have, have all of our electric fork trucks charging at the same time the whole city wants to use electricity. Um, so I'm hoping that at some point we'll get some sort of smart grid going um, within the city where 
we could actually provide our forklifts to, you know, be um, like a, a load, load demand response type setup instead of us just putting a relay in. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, really, really hopeful that uh, at some point in the near future here, we can, uh, you know, all work together to help equalize the, the load demand instead of, you know, being reactive like that. And then we've, we've done all the, the insulation and walls and that sort of fun stuff too. That's uh, I think that was some of our quickest payback period from a, a load reduction standpoint, aside from LEDs. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just take moderator's prerogative just for a moment, just to comment uh, that the time and location of a saved kilowatt hour, historically we've all kind of just assumed it's the same value at any time. And as Ben was just hinting, just the time value of that savings does matter more and more as we're pushing the grid. So that kind of controls is really a booming area that we've seen from the work I've done at ACEEE. Um, Tim, how about you as a, someone who, who makes some high-tech, high um, advanced technologies for lighting and other things? Probably not the best spokesman for the high-tech end of it. I'm sure Chuck can go well more into it. But, uh, you know, solid state LED lighting is evolving with the many controls packages to enable all sorts of oversight within a building and uh, all of the different services and utilities that are tied to it. Um, there are, again, many that can speak more eloquently to it than I, but the uh, <clears throat> pairing of, you know, our lighting or others lighting with the full array of different controls on the market is uh, uh, allowing some um, more granular control over a lot of things you might not think of initially uh, controlling. So, anyway, the easy, if the uh, occupancy sensor doesn't go off for a certain number of minutes. It also turns on the heat and air conditioning in that room. So it's an unoccupied setting. And okay, I'll, Chuck can probably elaborate more on that, but the ability to use your lighting system to communicate whatever it needs to communicate to control other things throughout facilities is, is a reality now. Mm -hmm. Very good. And Chuck? Well, Tim hit it on the head. And, you know, COVID was the exclamation point around occupancy in buildings. So, you know, when, when, when COVID hit, it changed everything. It's all the occupancy patterns of a building changed. And all of our design standards for systems within a building are built on the way it used to be. So what's happening now is big data and individualized, personalized comfort control. So in other words, you know, in the future, you're gonna, you're gonna have on your phone, every time you walk into a building, you're going to say, am I comfortable? Do I want it warmer or cooler? And the lighting system is going to track based on the WAP, the, the pickup of your cell phone signal, where you are in the building. And it's going to, it can pre-schedule. Like, let's say that, Dan, let's say that you like your conference rooms dark because you're working on your computer. Or let's say Andy wants, or Andrew wants a lighter room because he's working on a whiteboard. Uh, and maybe you like it warmer than he does. You go to your phone, you click in, it says go to, you know, Dan, you're supposed to go to 104, Andrew's supposed to go to room 403. And only those, those particular scenes will be set up for you, similar to what Tim was saying, but also temperature control. And in addition, they're looking at your phone being able to read your skin temperature because of the COVID skin temperature testing to be able to predict whether you're going to be comfortable or not comfortable. So there's a lot happening in that space. And this gets back to reduce the amount of energy consumption for the appropriate amount of occupancy so you can produce green electricity. Very good. All right, let's see, Sean. What do you, where do you see in your building operations? What, where's the future? Um, the future is obviously built around data. And I, I, I wanna say that facilities operations in the past has been uh, one of those areas where we have a tremendous amount of data, but we haven't always been the best at understanding the value of our data. And we're starting to see that change. Uh, understanding the need to uh, integrate systems intelligently 
uh, in integrating disparate systems, uh, things around uh, much to what Chuck was talking about, uh, the Wi-Fi, the cell phones, things like that, understanding where people are in a facility. When do people arrive in the facility? bringing in an outside uh, air temperature, weather conditions, and understanding building performance, and uh, intelligently bringing on those systems just at the right time to make sure that the building is conditioned for occupants when they leave, I mean, when they arrive, but also understand when can you start backing off systems so that uh, when people start leaving, they're still comfortable, but you're already saving energy. Um, a lot of this also ties in with the uh, grid interactive efficient buildings, making sure that our facilities can communicate with utilities at some point in the future to understand what are their production needs and what can we do to uh, push back on some of the energy that we're using to help out our neighbors so that we're all benefiting from less energy use, uh, less power production, which translates to cleaner air. It all starts off with data and uh, that can be daunting, but one of the beautiful things about uh, the future of data is its accessibility. Just making sure that, yeah, all the algorithms that do all the complex stuff in the background do their things and do it right, but the way it's presented to the end user is in a very approachable, very understandable way. Very good. All right. Um... Switching to another look ahead, um, I'd like to get your perspectives on what you see might, is needed to achieve more Wisconsin energy efficiency potential. We've heard that there's a lot of it out there and we've gotten a lot of uh, pushes to achieve that for carbon reduction goals um, by the state of Wisconsin, as well as an increasing number of businesses, industries, utilities have staked out some pretty high carbon reduction goals. And um, so where do you see that coming from and is that possible? I'm gonna start with Tim as someone who's involved with lighting where historically we've gotten much of the energy savings to date through improved lighting from that lowly little incandescent bulb of years past and mm. to CFLs and now um, LEDs. And some people would say, well, is that well of savings dry because we've gotten as good as we can get? Um, but not just restricting ourselves to looking at lighting, but where, where are we gonna get the next big savings from? It is going to be you know, a combination of controls. I think it's still a huge opportunity, but then the, uh, how am I, I don't have the answer. You ought to shift the conversation from the, you know, uh, just purely environmental uh, right thing to do versus a real business decision. Every kilowatt I don't use, I'm saving money. Every kilowatt I get an incentive on, I've saved twice. Uh, so really engaging in uh, all manufacturers and businesses that we all consume a lot of electrons. How do we package what is available out there? And again, you know, increasing the focus dollars that's available. But the uh, solar project we have uh, on our roof right now is an excellent example of a partnership directly between a business and a utility. Uh, we could not make the ROI work for us uh, for solar directly. So solar now program bridge that gap. Um, so I think a business to business sharing of what is available and, um, you know, it is the right thing to do, but it's the right thing to do and you're going to save a bunch of money or avoid a bunch of costs when doing so. Very good. So I'm going to bounce this over to Chuck, especially since you mentioned that uh, Johnson Controls is trying to work with customers to get to net zero. And is, is that the path and that we see that possible, maybe give an example of a place in Wisconsin that's achieved that? So uh, I can't give you that off the top of my head, but okay. here's what I'll tell you the big changes in the market. And that is that um, for the first time that, that I've seen, in, and I've been doing this 30, 35 years, um, the private sector is getting very interested in carbon reduction, uh, largely due to the pressure that Blackstone has put on the financial markets. So some of the biggest investors into private sector companies are, are saying that they're not going to invest into companies that, are, that don't have extremely strong sustainability programs. That has got the ear of the CFOs in the private sector. So um, 
that has been a big change and will continue to be a driver. We're seeing all sorts of companies interested that, you know, it wasn't that they were int not interested in before, it just wasn't a priority. Um, so that's really important. What I think can move this along that path to net zero is building performance standards and having increases in focus on energy funding to help people get to higher perform building performance standards. And we've seen it in New York City, we've seen it in San Francisco, we've seen it in a number of cities across the United States where they have a labeling, uh, they, have a, they have a series of sequential um, incentives and penalties at some point. And I think that that would be a, a dramatic change to, to really put it on everybody's windshield. Very good. Um, I see we're rounding up near the hour, so I wanted to hit some a couple questions that came in from the audience here. Um, one of them is the time range that the MIA study was looking at, the numbers presented for year, decade, et cetera. I would just, I, I know Maddie would be happy to answer that maybe offline or directly. I know she gave the contact information and mentioned that the report will be published soon. So I think that one we've, will be addressed, uh, maybe some follow-up. And then we have a question here, and this might be more for Andrew and Maddie who follow um, more of the politics and policies. Uh, here's a question. It's my impression that joint finance has trimmed the proposed increase in focus money from the state budget. If correct, what is the plan for getting the full legislature, Governor Evers, to put an increase back in the final budget? I don't know if, if anyone wants to take a crack at that. That's a, that, that could probably take up an hour of discussion, but um, if anybody has a quick answer for the panelists or other participants, that would be great. Andrew, anything about that? Yeah, um, my, from my knowledge, yes, um, it hasn't been considered in um, uh, the current budget that the legislature is looking at right now. So it would have to be a standalone um, policy item that would be uh, considered in the future before the legislature. And I, I'm not sure what all the parties are doing currently uh, to get that going. I'm sure they're interested in working on the budget first and foremost. Um, but Renew and a lot of our organizations obviously will be supporting that in the future to, to get the increased focus on energy uh, going in, in the future. Very good. All right. So now we're going to have a lightning closing comments round where I'll just ask each panelist if they've got 30 seconds worth of uh, concluding remarks, and then we'll wrap it up and let you all proceed on your days. So, Sean, any final comments? Uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, being able to uh, be a part of this uh, panel board with uh, some fantastic uh, uh, thought leaders within uh, Wisconsin has been wonderful. Uh, the questions have been uh, challenging at times, but uh, just you know, talking about the future and uh, the challenges ahead and the opportunities ahead have been a lot of fun. So thank you. Great. How about Ben? Pons it to you next. Yeah, ditto Sean's comments. And like I said earlier, I just really appreciate the opportunity to be involved here and uh, you know, like to hear what everybody's doing going forward. It's an exciting group. And thanks for everybody for uh, for joining. All right, Tim, how about you? Uh, again, thanks to all. And I'll just put in a plug for the 50,001 Ready program through the DOE Navigator. It is a, uh, and whatever, uh, strategic energy management forum you have available to you through your focus on energy or uh, local provider, take advantage of it. And finally, Chuck. Yeah, um, just kudos to the panel, kudos to everybody on the call. I really liked what Ben was talking about as it related to embedded benefits downstream from energy efficiency. And there are two net zero projects in Wisconsin, Appleton Airport, Otagami, and uh, Northeastern Wisconsin Technical College. And I, there may be others now, but I know of those too. Excellent. So thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, very good. Well, first I'll thank all the panelists here. This has been wonderful. And then I'm gonna, here's contact information for those of us who work in these kind of organizations whose job it is to kind of spread some of this information, do research on these policies and programs. And I'll bounce it back to Andrew for kind of closing this out. Thank you all. Well, thanks, Dan, and all the panelists for joining us today. Uh, for everyone who attended, I hope you got a little bit more out of uh, what the 
outlook is for focus on energy and the impact for our Wisconsin businesses. Uh, if you're interested in these type of webinars, feel free to look at Renew Wisconsin. We've got on the events webpage that we can look at uh, future webinars in the future. I know that we've got an EV roundtable happening tomorrow as well. So a lot of stuff going on right now and look forward to seeing you guys in the future. Have a good day, everybody.